folks. Now that we have one EXO, Siddharth Srinivasan. Siddharth, are you here? Hi there. Okay, good, 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 good. Let me do a um, quick introduction of Siddharth. Siddharth is one of, as I, as I uh, shared with you, I've known Siddharth from when he was a small kid. Now, let me just say, I'm actually pleading with him to hire me as one of his employees, but he believes that, you know, I'm not yet ready to, to go work for him. Um, so, some of you already know about um, Siddharth. Siddharth is a founder, um, a founder and CEO of uh, this company called Flashbots. And I'll let Siddharth walk through his journey. And Siddharth is also a writing freshman at, uh, at Stanford. And he lives in, he's a Texan entrepreneur. And uh, so we're going to have Siddharth share his journey. And then we're going to try and map it to what are the extraordinary skills? How did Siddharth went from being an ordinary, you know, elementary and middle school and the high school student to become an extraordinary, a little extraordinary, and then uh, where his journey is, and then um, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, resume some of our discussion. Siddharth, all yours. Awesome, thank you for the fantastic uh, introduction. Um, and I did prepare a couple of slides, and so I'll share my screen so we have that. Um, Awesome. Well, you can see this all good. Yep. Perfect. So yeah, again, I appreciate that introduction. Um, like uh, he said, I am Siddharth Srinivasan. I'm born and raised here in Austin, Texas. Um, went to elementary school, middle school, high school here, um, and took a gap year this year to focus on building the company even more. Um, and finally, I'm going to be going and being a freshman at Stanford. Uh, you know, I say this year, but it's, you know, coming up in less than a month now, I'll be moving in. So I'm super excited to finally be going to the West Coast. Um, but yeah, so here, here's the journey as to how I started Trash Pops with my brother, um, you know, starting from a young age and getting inspired with an entrepreneurship um, and then finally creating Trash Pops. And so before we get started, a little bit about Trash Bots. Um, Trash Bots is a platform. It's a very affordable platform to teach students kindergarten through 12th grade robotics, coding, engineering, math, science, basically STEM skills. Um, and there's three parts to the platform. There's, there's an app, there's this robot, and there's curriculum. I'll talk about this all much later, but just wanted to give you a little bit of context as to what the company um, you know, we built was. Um, but, you know, let's, 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 you know, rewind the table a bit and go back to the beginning of, uh, as to how we got started with this entire journey. And so where it all began. And so you can see here how my brother and I look a little bit older, uh, sorry, a little bit younger. Um, and that's because we are, um, I think, seven and nine. And so way back then, we actually started a lemonade stand. Um, we did this because, you know, our, our, our parents wanted to give us something to do, kind of offload us for the summer. Um, you know, we were, I guess, being too annoying at home. Um, and so we went and set up this lemonade stand outside this yoga studio um, and, and, and sold this, this uh, lemonade. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. We went and got some investors, which is our parents, who basically put up the money for um, the stand and for uh, the lemons and the mint and the jugs and the cups and all that stuff. And overall, we made, I think, a whopping maybe 200 bucks, which is a lot for us. Um, and, you know, we took that money and we delegated it out um, and actually had to, had to pay back our parents, uh, you know, like half the, pro half the revenue from our lemonade stand. Then everything else, you know, we wanted to keep it, but we actually ended up giving it back to a um, nonprofit that we were very close with. And so Roth and I, you know, at that age, we didn't really truly appreciate it, but we ended up having, you know, no profits from this. Um, but you know, growing up and reflecting upon that lemonade stand, there were quite a few very, very important things we learned um, that we applied later to the startup. Um, and there's three learnings. And so the first one is being unique. Instead of creating normal, you know, lemon lemonade, <laughs> we created this raspberry apple mint lemonade, um, throwing in a bunch of fruits and stuff like that. And, you know, to, 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 to a normal outsider, it, you know, it looks a lot more healthy and so it might be less appetizing but we were sitting right outside a yoga studio. And so these yoga moms would come right out, out of their workouts and be like, oh my God, healthy lemonade, you know, buy me a cup, right? And so um, we catered to our audience very, very well and we were very unique. And so because of that, 
we were able to sell a lot more lemonade. The second thing is being opportunistic, right? I mean, we started off by selling one cup here, one cup there. But then one of the moms came to us and said, hey, we're having a party tonight. Is there anywhere I could buy a jug of this? And I was like, of course. And so from there on, we were like, wow, well, you know, we can make a dollar off of selling one cup or we can make 15 bucks selling a jug. And so, you know, from then on, when we ever a customer came up to our stand, we'd ask them, hey, like, you know, would you like a bulk delivery? Would you like, would you like a whole jug? We'd be happy to give you that. And so it's being very opportunistic about our sales. And third one is being socially responsible. Um, you know, in general, whenever you go along an entrepreneurial pursuit or whatever pursuit it is, you have to make sure to give back. I know you guys were just talking about that with this ordinary, extraordinary activity, um, but it's, it's not just about thinking about yourself and about um, you know, maximizing profit for yourself, but it's maximizing worldly profit, you know, making um, the world a better place. And so we ended up, like I said, giving a lot, you know, whatever money we had left to a nonprofit. And, um, you know, that nonprofit actually ended up, it's called the Miracle Foundation. Um, that nonprofit ended up becoming very essential to the starting of our company. Um, but, you know, that, that, that was the third learning that we had is, being socially responsible in our endeavors and making sure to give back at every corner because, you know, that will, you know, it, it's good karma. It always uh, help you in the end, basically, and, you know, help make the world a better place. Um, and so these three learnings is something that we really took to heart and, you know, iterated a lot upon, thought a lot about as, as we grew up and um, started on pursuits. But in general, I mean, this, this one process that I know, I think, I think you guys have talked a lot about has come to light through this, um, through, through this, through this uh, lemonade stands endeavor. And that's, you know, <clears throat> how do you find success in these endeavors? And Roth and I realized that, you know, if you find a purpose, right, something that has a goal at the end, you, you, you have a purpose of something you want to go and hit, and you're really, really passionate about it, you really want to see it done, because, you know, you've been in this spot um, for a while, and you practice and practice and practice it, put that, you know, put that passion towards your purpose over and over and over again, you will innately find success. Like it's, it's, it's inevitable that you'll find success if you keep practicing long enough. And so that's what Roth and I did. Roth is my brother, by the way. <laughs> that's what Roth and I did. Um, you know, so we took our passion for entrepreneurship. Roth and I, you know, have had a long series of um, starting companies and iterating upon it. Uh, Roth actually did some business plan competitions. You can see him on the top left. Um, presenting some suit at a local business plan competition. On the top right, you can see me as this little chubby boy on the left. Um, and I think you guys are covering it. But yeah, my brother's over there in the black shirt on the right. Um, this was at the um, local TEDx conference. And so we, you know, learned a lot about entrepreneurship there and, and got really big into what does entrepreneurship mean and how do, you, how do you go and pursue that and how do you start your own company? And then at the bottom here, here's the first check we ever um, received at South, by, at South by Southwest EDU at the student startup competition where we won a thousand bucks for um, trash bots. Um, so that was super exciting. Um, and so gen and generally, you know, Roth and I were very passionate about entrepreneurship and how you, know, you can create your own solution, create your own product that can go and benefit students and people all around the world. Um, you know, and then we found our purpose. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that we had taken the money that we'd gained from this lemonade stand, giving it back to this on this, um, sorry, this uh, nonprofit called the Miracle Foundation. So a couple years later, in 2013, where I was in sixth grade, my brother was in eighth grade. My parents, you know, through Miracle Foundation, decided to start taking us to their orphanages. And so a little bit of context on Miracle Foundation: they actually help run orphanages um, in India and, and, and support students all across the world. Um, who have been put in like the orphanage system, children's home system, you know, foster care system, stuff like that. And so in starting in 2013, when I was sixth grade, my brother was eighth grade, we started going to these orphanages. Um, you know, what initially started as fun games and singing and dance, you know, year over year after we went, we started taking more, you know, science kits, you know, math activities. And finally, you can see in 2015, some robotics kits too, where they're making little robotic stuff, um, and you can see how me and my brother also got older throughout the years here. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is where we really got this purpose of, you know, there are smart students all around the world, right? 
But the issue here is in lack of resources, right? These kids are, um, you know, maybe given a textbook or two to learn from in, in, in a one classroom um, school, but they're not given the high level resources that my brother and I were afforded when we were growing up, given that we were just more fortunate in the way that we were born and raised, right? I mean, these kids given some, you know, accessible uh, tool would be able to really harness that tool and go and do something great with it. I actually, you guys are lucky this morning. So something, something very funny happened. I wasn't even planning to talk about this, but I woke up and I had a message from one kid that I had um, become very close to in this orphanage. I'd completely fallen out of touch with him, but I met him in 2013 and saw him, you know, a couple of years, you know, saw him a couple of times after that. We became very close. We were the same age, um, super smart guy. Uh, he was a lot shorter, with, shorter than me, but loved playing cricket. Um, I'm sure you guys know what that is. Um, and so he, he um, we became very close, but I completely fell out of touch with him, you know, 2016 onwards. And he just found me on Instagram and, uh, and, and, and texted me, right? And it's fascinating. I asked him what he's up to these days. And he's right now getting his bachelor's of engineering in computer science and engineering um, in India. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, you know, from going from this children's home and having less resources. I mean, we took some robotics and hopefully that helped inspire him a little bit. But he really, I mean, it's very difficult to go, in, you know, start in a place that doesn't have that many resources and, and um, tools for you to go and um, express, you, you know, in, in any avenues to express your, you know, coding and math and science and even creativity and problem solving skills. But he was able to battle against all of that and, um, uh, you know, go and get, get a computer science degree. And I, I'm, I've been exchanging messages with him all morning, but he says he hopes to sometime come and settle in the US uh, in an engineering job, which I think is amazing. And I have full confidence that he'll be able to do it. Um, but anyways, that's a small side tangent story, but I thought you guys would get a kick from that. Um, but but more, more so even, I mean, you can see how smart these kids are. It's just a lack of resources, really. And so, um, you know, Roth and I set out to with, with this goal of creating a more accessible STEM education platform that we can go and use to impact schools and students, you know, in the U.S., but all across the world as well. And so we created TrashBots. Um, like I said earlier, it's a platform to teach students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, you know, every, everything from you know, coding to robotics to STEM, um, all, all these different things. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. You know that. And so um, I was told that I should be doing a demo today. And so I did have a, a unit on my desk that I'll show y'all. Um, but this is what the product looks like when one receives it. And I hope y'all can see my face as well as the presentation. Thumbs up if you can. Yeah. Awesome. So this is what the product looks like. Um, comes in this little box. We've gone through a couple of iterations on the design and stuff like that, but I'm really happy where it's ended up. Um, and you open it up and this is what it looks like inside. There are some, usually some uh, getting started materials that come on top, but I use this kit enough to not have not need the getting started materials anymore. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry so, to interrupt. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I'm here on Zoom, and I all I see is the slide. I, I'm unable to see you demonstrating the kit. Is there any way you can get on the video or? I so I'm on video right now. I'm I'm sure there's it's it's the Zoom display you're on. Is there a button in the corner just, that makes just uh, stop the screen sharing for a moment, Sadra? So it'll it'll go just back to video, button. and then you can go back. Sure. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, I think what one is yeah. I think, you know, when he is doing the demo after the slide worked, you know, you do the stop sharing. Siddharth, are you done with the slides? I can see, no. I can see the people now. So I think uh, Siddharth can Yeah, yeah. It. I'm not done with the slides, but I'll go back to it. I'll do a quick demo and then I'll go back to the slides. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, sorry, Priya. This is what I was saying the box looks like when the kid, kid receives it. Um, it. Comes looking like this. And when I open it up, this is what it looks like inside. But it's all centered around this one central robot. And so I'll turn this on. And you can see how there's an LED matrix, there's two motors, there's a speaker, and there's six different sensors, an accelerometer, thermometer, gyro, motor encoder, compass, and buttons. And so you can see here how there's you know, a ton of different outputs, ton of different inputs. And so we're really trying to teach kids about what real world engineering looks like. You know, It's hard for a lot of kids to get that grasp um, especially given what current day products look like that are very expensive, very inaccessible, um, you know, very limited in terms of capabilities, even though they're so expensive. 
And so we're trying to give as many different outputs and inputs as possible while keeping the cost as low as we can um, and, and also running programs to also sponsor schools and stuff like that. Um, but uh, this is what the product looks like. You know, they can build on the sides here. Then you can see these motors. And so we have, you know, stuff like these pucks, um, plastics. And so these have slits for, you know, popsicle sticks. We have three different sizes of gears. And so the whole idea behind trash bots is that kids are taking our robot and adding on different trash materials to it. Because one idea that we thought of is like, you know, these kids, what they can do is they can source recyclable materials from around them. They're drinking water out of bottles. They have plastic utensils. They have tape. They have string. They have pipe cleaners. They have PVC pipes. They can take all of those items and add it onto the robot that we're giving them. And so by doing that, by, by allowing our users to source materials from their environment, we are able to make the cost a lot lower um, and make it much more accessible and make kids able to develop their problem solving and creativity skills because um, they're not just confined to what's inside the kit they're confined to anything they can find around them they're confined to what's inside their imagination which i think is super super cool um so anyway so that's what the the robot looks like but our, our pieces are outfitted to support you know plugging in popsicle sticks putting a rubber band around it you know adding on gears and axles and learning about different mechanical solutions too and so that's what the actual hardware product looks like any questions on that? I guess we can make it a yeah, little more Yeah, just a quick question. You were talking about yeah. all these other things that they can work with. So do you have that incorporated in your curriculum? Do you talk about how they could use some of these articles? And yeah, and so uh -huh. I'll, get to that in a, I'll get to that in a second, but we have almost 100 hours of curriculum at this point, um, spanning kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. They're all project-based. There's a video that lasts one to two minutes long. We have a student card as well as a teacher card. And so, um, you know, the whole idea here is making it such that the teachers don't really need as much teacher training. A lot of these platforms out there right now, you go and make an, a deployment of the product, but the teachers are completely lost as to what to do. And it kind of just, you know, starts gaining shelf life. You just leave it on the shelf and collects dust. And so what we're doing is we're making our curriculum as easy as possible to use for the teachers. And in that way, the teachers can pick it up and use it as easily as possible and start teaching the, teach teaching the students um, as soon as possible. Um, and so I just we, love we how you thought of the whole, I love how you thought of the whole cycle, not just creating something for the kids, but also for someone to train them. And, you know, right. I'm, for that. I think that's brilliant. So I appreciate like a holistic, that. holistic solution. And I love that. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea here is Roth and I saw the problem from, <coughs> excuse me, from both the, um, the student angle, as well as the teacher angle. I mean, as students, we were growing up and in robotics teams, um, you know, we were doing robotics competitions and taking robotics classes. I actually started coding in like fourth grade and took a lot of boot camps every single summer as much as I could. And I was fortunate enough to have access to those type of things. Um, but, you know, through that, saw what current day coding and robotics and engineering education looks like and saw that we need to redo it from the student angle. But also, you know, going and teaching workshops in India, but also in Peru, in Mexico, in the US, we saw that from the teacher angle too, it's really hard for teachers to know what to do with these things. because there's so little resources. I mean, for a, lot of these re for a lot of these platforms, the best you can do is go and plop the kit down from the student and say, do what you will with this, right? Or I spent hours of my own time and figure out what the resources look like. But either way, it's a lose-lose situation. Like nobody's winning out of this whole experience with current day platforms. And so that's why we figured we'll create something that students have a better experience and teachers have a vastly better experience too. So um, yeah, so coming back to the demo. So the first part of our platform is our hardware, like I just showed you. Um, and so students are playing around with that. Second part of our platform is our app. And so we have an app. Uh, that we developed ourselves that basically, you know, it, it teaches students about what, you know, coding concepts look like. Um, and so kids are going from knowing nothing about coding to what does block programming look like? And so kids are being able to, you know, drag up blocks and stuff like this and click on them and edit them. Stuff like that. And so, so, you know, in the realm of education, the coding concepts are super important because once you learn the coding concepts, you can go and learn something like Python, which if you don't know, Python is a very, very widely, you know, industry respected language, probably one of the top three languages used by developers today. 
um, because it's so versatile. You can use it for chips. You can use it for web applications. You can use it for phone applications. Python is very, very versatile. And so, um, you know, we made this app that works as the foundation to go and teach kids Python. And so it takes kids from knowing, you know, with a few taps of buttons, knowing nothing about coding to coding concepts all the way up to Python coding through our whole software thing. And finally, the third part of our platform, as Priya was asking about earlier, we have 100 hours of curriculum now spanning kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. They're all project based and they're all rooted in the engineering process, which is basically this cycle of thinking, building, testing, and going through that process as you go towards and work towards your goal. Similar to you know, how you create a company too. I mean, you think about what the company would be, you go and build out the company, and then you iterate upon this company. You go and say, oh, you know, I think that our customers would benefit from more curriculum. And so you go build more curriculum, and then you go test that curriculum, right? And as you test it, you see, oh my God, wait, you know, the teachers are not finding... Um, the teachers want some way to assess their students. They want some tests. And so you go think about how to build those tests. You go build out more tests and you go and test it with teachers and say, do the teachers like this? Oh, the teachers want, you know, a different kind of product. We'll go build that out and go iterate, iterate, iterate. And this whole engineering process is what we're teaching students through our curriculum. Um, you know, you use it in engineering. We also use it in other disciplines in life. And so that's what our product looks like. Um, does anybody have any questions about that whole, um, you know, product suite? So Siddharth, for the 100 hours of curriculum, what is a typical journey of, you know, somebody, let's say, from a kindergarten to, to go through it? How long would it typically take, you know, to go from the beginner elementary level to getting to mastering Python? What is the average? And what did you design it for? Yeah, and so when I say almost 100 hours of lessons, we actually have 100, like, modules that each last approximately an hour. And so in these modules, what happens is, you know, they'll start by watching a small video that basically gets their, you know, gears turning, the cogs turning as to how do I go about and, um, you know, do this lesson? How do I go about and achieve this goal? Um, the next slide I was about to show basically, you know, brings it to life a little bit more. And actually, let me just really quickly share my screen. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, bringing the platform to life a little bit more and see, you know, how accessible trash bots and how, you know, the breadth of possibilities of things you can make with trash bots, you know, at the very youngest age, let's say like you're saying, Shania, a kindergartner, they can go and make a bird feeder out of like some paper and popsicle sticks in our, in our product, right? And so, um, you know, there's no coding, no engineering necessary there, you know, kindergartners, first graders, second graders, they love just working with their hands, like Legos almost, right? And so the whole idea with all of our level one activities are just using the pieces, building bird feeders, building, um, you know, uh, a, a tower, building a utensil, um, building a claw, stuff like that, right? They're all using the pieces and building interesting solutions like this, incorporating different, you know, recyclable and trash materials, right? Once that's mastered enough, then they can go on to like, you know, level two and level three activities. Level two activities use the robot and the app actually uses numbers. Level three activity, you can see one level three activity we have here uses sensors too. And so this one uses the buttons. And so kids are using the gear trains to see, you know, how can I make a fishing pole that's most effective, right? And kids are having to think about, you know, okay, I'm going to go use this fishing pole to go and find a fish, right? But in order to pick up a big fish, does the hook need to be stronger? Does it need to reel in faster? Does the string need to be stronger? Does there need to be more gears, less gears? Right? There's so many different variables that the students can iterate upon. And so we're really trying to inspire that within the students of like, you know, this risk-taking ability and the ability to be like, oh, you know, let me try to edit one vertical of this and see if I can improve how the largest fish that this, this fishing pole, the maximum capacity of this fishing pole, basically. And then, you know, as students get even older, they can program it using Python to maybe make it into a box right, where they're playing a lot of notes using this, or use some of the more complex sensors like the gyro and make a self-balancing robot, right? So you can see how we designed this such that anybody can use it. And so one thing we say a lot is a low ceiling, high floor, or sorry, low floor, high ceiling, completely messed that up, right? And a low floor, high ceiling means that low floor is students with very, very minimal effort can get onboarded with our platform and start learning things. Right. The floor is very low in terms of them to start learning with trash bots. 
but the ceiling being very very high you know on on the on the hardware side they can hack it with the pieces and, and bring in you know tape and string and pipe cleaners and straws and cans and bottles and then on the coding side kids can start using python and and you know even recently we even added the ability to start learning ai and machine learning through this product and so it's super super powerful from a programming point of view too but it's also very very easy to get started with this platform and so so very very versatile in terms of a platform and, and very much toned to any student's needs whether you've even um, heard of coding and robotics or if you are a master coder and just want something to apply your learnings to in a, a physical setting does that make sense Yep, yep. Um, very much. Hey, so Darth, can I say one thing? Um, you know, there's often an inverse correlation between, you mentioned the children that didn't have a lot of resources. There's often an inverse correlation between resources and resourcefulness. You have a lot of resources, you don't have to be that resourceful. Absolutely. But the thing I love about what you're doing here is you're giving them resources, but you're also teaching them to be resourceful. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the greatest outcomes of what you've got here. So I commend you. It's amazing. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, what we've seen is real engineers don't go to Home Depot every single time they need to build something. They look around them. I mean, I can, I can, if you guys want, it's a little bit messy, but I can give you a little room tour where I've, you know, recommissioned a lot of different boxes and recyclable materials in my room. I mean, I actually, um, this is a complete tangent, but I joined an acapella team this year out of Stanford. Um, and for that, since it's been all virtual, I've had to record a lot of videos of myself singing. So we can stitch them together in music videos. And with my lamp, I've used this weird plastic piece I found, plus two rubber bands. Um, and hey, you need to stop sharing. I'm missing out all this. Oh, I'm not. I'm not showing anything on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but it's but it's 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 two rubber bands, an empty tape roll, a popsicle stick that I've kind of carved down. I've used that to build something that I can use to record videos with a lot of light, um, like a makeshift little lamp type of thing. Um, and I, but, I, but I think that's what real like, engineers have to do is use what you have, use the plywood lying around, use the drill bits you have lying around and take all of those and build something amazing. Um, that's what an engineer really has to do because there's not infinite resources in this world. So, so Siddha, why don't you do a quick uh, tour of your, your uh, playground, uh, your tinker shop you know, with some of the possibilities that you created with your trash pots. And I think you know, I, I would be truly inspired. How, Sorry, trash bots, how, how trash bots is, is kind of assisting your life to create more, better experiences. Let me actually, I, I think the best thing to do actually would let yeah. me share my screen and yeah. show you our curriculum. And that yeah. will give you guys an idea of the breadth of possibilities that one can create with the trash bots. Love it. Um, I wouldn't mind that tour of your room either. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit messy at the moment. We just got back from a vacation. And so there are some clothes strewn here and there. Um, but next time I'll do that. Um, and so here's our uh, website. I just pulled it up. Um, but if you go to a portal, and this is something everybody can do. It's, you know, our, our curriculum is right now, you know, free to access. We do some curriculum licenses for school districts, but um, for the one-off person, uh, you can go and jump into our curriculum and check it out. Um, so I went to our website, went to portal, and this is where you can find access to all of our stuff. T-Blocks, real quick, was the app I was showing you. We have it available on iOS and Android, but also as a web app. And so if I had a tr my trash bots, I can connect this up right here. And maybe if I want to see that, I can even show you in action a little bit. Um, and then T-Build is our lessons. As you can see here, here's all of our lessons. Block one, we really focus on onboarding the students. But block two is where you can see the bulk of our lessons. Um, as you can see here, uh, I was talking about this level one, level two, level three earlier. And so you can see like utensil activity and there's a a little video here and a student card. So the student card looks like, and so like, again, along this engineering process of designing, building, testing, improving, 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 you know, iterating upon that until you have the best version of the product as possible. And we have teacher resources too that uh, fall this before, during, after model where students are really, um, you know, teachers are really knowing what to ask the students to make sure they're learning along the way, you know, what to, what to be, what to be um, thinking about, what to be reflecting about as you go along this process. Um, and then like about a two minute video that basically goes through these exact eight steps. 
so that students know exactly what to be doing. And you can see how we've been building out lessons such at, <coughs> at a rapid pace here. Um, you know, in level one, without using the robot or the app, we can build a utensil, a race car, handheld fan, picture frame. Um, I was showing you all the bird feeder earlier, but all these different, uh, different, different possibilities. Level two is using the robot, um, but not yet um, using the um, sensors. And so you can see here the fishing pool activity, uh, like I was showing you all a second ago, um, you know, the catapult activity. And you can see here a little bit of the trash incorporation using a skinny pop bag to, uh, and, and tape to catapult things into the air. Um, the basketball activity, something that dunks basketballs, um, you know, ping pong ball into a bag, um, you know, a lot of different things. And, and two, we have five different content developers who are developing content on a weekly basis. And you can see here, there's lessons that I haven't even clicked on yet. Um, the gear training activity and rolling pin activity, which you know, I'm excited to check out at some point. Um, and level three lessons are the most interesting in my opinion, because they are um, using the sensors on our product as well. Um, so stuff like the car activity that keeps driving until it hits an obstacle and backs up and keeps driving. The temperature measurement activity where you can go and measure the trash butt under different conditions. Fan activity, when it gets too hot in the room, it'll turn a fan on that you've designed yourself to cool down the room. Um, the music button activity, connecting every single uh, button to a different note so you can play like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Lamb. Annoyed trash bot is one of my favorite ones where it's like, you know, the trash bot's kit will smile but when you shake it up, it'll frown, actually. And so some really interesting things you can do with uh, the sensors incorporated, too. But I mean, this gives you an idea of the breadth of possibilities. I mean, you know, the rover activity, you're building something that'll drive over. Look at this, you know, tread it has like a tank almost that'll drive over a lot of different obstacles. Uh, Double-decker bus, um, you know, something that when you click the buttons and it jerkily starts, the passengers or, the, you know, the coins, but the passengers won't fall off. Um, and, you know, again, so many different activities here. Does that give you an idea of kind of the world of trash bots and, you know, the different things that one could create with the product? I have yeah. a few questions, Srini. I mean, if somebody else wants to okay. Sorry, Priya. Priya, one second. So one is, um, so Siddharth, are you done? The, yeah, I mean, I, I was... I I was going to wrap up the, the deck real quick, but you no, know, we yeah, can. Why don't you, why didn't you wrap up the deck? Yeah, please. Sure. Um, and then while, while you're doing that, you know, one is if you could also, I don't know if you have a uh, chart or a slide with, with all the capabilities that are there in the, in the current trash box design, like the different sensors, different controls that it have. Uh, is there any kind of a catalog of all the capabilities that are already available without extending the capabilities right now? Yeah, there's no slide on that, but I mean, I can briefly, I mean, there's the LED matrix, two yeah. motors, and the speakers, and then the six different sensors, like I talked about earlier. So accelerometer, which measures acceleration, thermometer, measures temperature, um, compass, it measures, obviously, direction, you guys know what a compass is, um, gyro, which measures, like, position, you know, like, which, which, which orientation it's in motor encoders which measures what position the motor is at and so like one really cool thing you can do is like connect the motor encoder to the speaker and so when you can go you can go like mm, something like that um and there's buttons obviously so you can you know two different buttons here um pretty digital interface there <laughs> so those are all the capabilities of the trash pots kit i see and then if, if people can actually customize it you know can they i put more sensors or is it like a closed platform so it's a closed platform from a technological standpoint. Yes, it is technically possible. Um, and I wish I could open up my robot here um, and oh. show you all what's inside, but we've created our own board inside that has some open pins that you could easily plug sensors into. It's not something we actively encourage, you know, students to do. It's, it's pretty much a closed system in terms of what you can do with it. But mm. from, a, you know, our company standpoint, it gives us a lot of optionality to add more sensors on in the future. And so we're thinking about ultrasonic sensors, color sensors, and IR sensors as possibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And why, why didn't you wrap up your session and then we can open up for Q&A? Yeah. And so real quickly, I was just going to talk about, um, you know, a little bit of our traction so far. Um, and so we've sold, you know, 15 school districts, 50 schools, thousands of students are using our product at this point. Um, so it's super exciting. You know, we recently did a deployment to a district in Wisconsin for um, 1,600 units. 
And so that was to every sixth grader in the entire district. We did um, a national deployment with one of the one of the biggest charter school networks in the U.S. basis charter schools. Um, to national deployment to fourteen of their schools across Texas, Arizona, and Louisiana. Um, and then more than that, we're in active discussions with a lot of huge districts. I mean, August and September are the biggest selling seasons in the year. And so we're super excited to finally close some of these school districts coming up now. Um, and then Rhodes and I personally have been profiled by Entrepreneur Magazine as, you know, top young entrepreneurs um, in the world, and as well as Texas Monthly as just top innovators in Texas. Um, so super excited, some really strong momentum. Um, you know, poised for growth here, it says the bottom of the slide, but um, you know, really excited about the progress that we've seen so far and about what, you know, is going to happen. Here's a little bit about our team. Um, and, and you can see here how Roth and I um, have kind of split up the, 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 um, the tasks between us um, and have figured out how best to go about this. And we've added on key personnel too, like our chief revenue officer who we brought on about a year ago. Um, who has been helping us, you know, scale our sales. Um, he came from uh, the this, this STEM 101, which is a curriculum distribution company before this. We have a head of content development who runs a team of content developers. And then we have a bunch of advisors too, who helped us, um, you know, start this company and move it along and advise us in different domain places. Um, but that just brings me, you know, to, to this, you know, reflecting upon this journey coming from at a young age, starting this lemonade stand and getting an idea of what does um, entrepreneurship look like to going and teaching around the world in India, Mexico, Peru, and the US to um, you know, starting this company and being able to impact the life's arc of students all around the world. And so we're really excited for you know, what's to come next and, and, and what we can take with these insights and, and to use to impact the world. And so just to conclude some, some um, you know, lessons we've learned here. Um, one is, I know all of y'all in the audience here today are, are very young um, and are just getting interested in entrepreneurship. But, you know, the first thing I'd say is entre at a young age is the best time you can start a company. Um, and that's because it's the most risk-free time. I mean, it's a, for, for a lot of us, it's, um, you know, you have free lodging in your parents' house, you know, food from your parents every night and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's a time where you don't have to worry about really taking care of other people. You know, you don't have a family to support, kids to support and stuff like that. And, and oftentimes at an, at an older age, entrepreneurship is a riskier bet because, you know, you, you're banking it all on this passion and this purpose um, behind creating a company and being young. And it's very risky. I mean, for me, obviously, I, I'm, I'm very excited about seeing trash bots to whatever end it comes to. But um, if I were to drop, drop trash bots tomorrow, I still am going to college in less than a month at Stanford where I'll get a degree and, you know, probably come out and, and, and find a job in the workspace. And so it's, it's, it's a very, very risk-free bet for me to start a company. And, and, and I encourage you all, all to think about that as you, um, you know, think about if, I, if you can start a company. Um, you know, number two is pursuing passions that have some purpose. Um, Roth and I were very, very passionate about this, um, about entrepreneurship, but also about this, uh, desire to reshape education. And so we had this purpose, we had this passion. And so once you have this car and once you add fuel to it, you just you know pedal to the metal and keep seeing where it'll take you. And, and we're very, very excited about where it's taken us so far. Um, and then a couple of lessons, you know, as you grow as an entrepreneur, um, you know, you saw on that team slide that we have a lot of mentors and advisors who have shown us the way and taught us about different areas um, and helped us reflect on different areas. And so that's very, very, um, important and then you know finding the tools and the peers that you need to to um get yourself into a better spot as an entrepreneur i mean our school had a lot of um resources and since our product was education focused there's a lot of educators at our school who helped us to um iterate upon it um and peers you know we, we, I, I employed a lot of my friends as um content developers and so they'd help make content for trash bots and i would compensate them a little bit you know from the company with that um, and I, I think I think that's mainly the um, you know the conclusions you can draw from this story is um, you know be passionate find something you're passionate about really you know put some fuel behind it and then grow along the way. I appreciate y'all for making the day. <laughs> I think let's all give a big round of applause. For... Thank you. Thank you. I think um, 
you know, before we do it, what I would love to do is let's quickly go around and I would like each one of you to share one insight from one insight from Siddharth's journey. And, uh, you know, just, just one insight, you know, what, what stood out at the top. And let's start with uh, people in the, in the Zoom. Um, Ritika, you want to go first? Yeah, so just an insight about this whole process. Hmm. Uh, but, but inside about the whole process, but what stood out for you? What was your learning? And how could you apply that to create uh, excellence or in, in your journey of being an entrepreneur? Anything that stood out? Yeah, I thought it was really cool how like young you guys started off with the, um, with the lemonade stand and where you guys are now. That's a huge like journey you had. And I thought how, I thought it was cool about um, how you guys implemented trash into the product to make it um, like cheaper for students to use. Love it, love it Ritika, so Appreciate beautiful that. insights. Thank you. And then uh, did it inspire you to uh, uh, create other ideas? You know, are there ideas flowing through your mind right now? Um, not right now, but I really admired the trash part a lot and I might implement that into something that I might do in the future. Love it. I think that's a beautiful insight. Um, Pardip? Um, I really liked how uh, you and your brother targeted like something that no one else was doing instead of like following any other bigger companies. You guys targeted like a subset of the, like the world that no one's like and doing anything for. And you guys created like a whole new platform for students to like get into robotics and engineering and it was like something that's never been done before or maybe attempted at but never like as in depth as you guys are taking it sure Love it, Partev. so that you know it's more inclusive something that hasn't been addressed you know which is for the underprivileged so so fantastic and uh paul Kind of I kind of touched on it when I said that you you know you're opening up the idea that you can be both resourceful and have a resource, but I think the fact that you have created something here that is a fun digestible way of getting into programming is huge because uh, you know I know Python's built on the C platform C language a lot, a lot of versatility. I used to program C++, um, not the most exciting thing in the world to do. So to be able to take that and make it a fun platform that inspires people, I, I think it's amazing. And I'm, I'm really upset that you're only a freshman in college. So, uh, you know, thanks for making me look bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's been an yeah. amazing journey. I'm really excited. Hey, I want to ask, though, are you planning to do anything with your, you know, at Yale or excuse me, at Stanford? Are you planning to? to take Trashbot there and do anything further? Or are you kind of going a different direction with your education? Yeah, absolutely planning on continuing Stanford. Um, you know, I think that one reason why I selected Stanford as my, um, you know, go-to school um, is the resources that it offers. And I'm sure, you know, Srini knows this, having having a daughter that went there. Um, you know, the, the resources that are offered at Stanford, um, both from, you know, an engineering standpoint, from a humanity standpoint, from a connection standpoint, and from an entrepreneurial standpoint is amazing. And so I definitely intend to, you know, utilize my peers and connections um, and continue to build out trash bots. And, you know, I know there's so much capital there in the Bay Area too. And so taking advantage of that too, to continue to grow trash bots and seed it in school districts all around the, the world. So, Good for uh, you. Think, you know, since we're running out of time, let's actually continue with the with the with the other things. Uh, sorry, and uh, but since that one thing, the the comment that you made about there's so much capital in the Bay Area, I'll take it up with you with your dad later. Um, <laughs> I says, um, oh, you know, so much more so much more capital than here in the in Austin. <laughs> no, 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 it's already recorded. Okay, so um, Priya. Yeah, so I think it's wonderful that their parents introduce them to this NGO, you know, to be empathetic, right? To have that right mindset. But the way these, um, you and your brother have taken it forward, you've married your your passion along with that, you know, your skills, you you brought in a lot of people to to help this evolve into uh, this, uh, from, a, from an idea into an actual product. And it's, 
it's making a huge difference. I think if anybody deserves to be in Stanford, it's you, Siddharth. I honestly say that. I, it's, I, I feel strangely gratified in some sense, you know, vicariously enjoying your success. So I, I hope you continue to build such products and, you know, I think it's, it's going to make a big difference. I have a nephew who is eight years old. I see a lot of potential, but there's nobody to help him out. My sister is a homemaker and my brother, brother-in-law works as a clerk in a bank. So I'm going to buy this product. I honestly mean that. Try it out myself and introduce it to him and then I go to India. So I might even reach out to you, Siddharth. So uh, yeah, not take do. up a lot of no. time. But please I think do. It's, no, it's yeah. Later in the Q&A, what I was going to ask you is, uh, sorry, sorry, Priya, 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 sorry. Let's actually sorry. quickly, because we're running out of the time, let's quickly capture oh, everything. I'm so sorry. Yeah, sorry. No worries. So, please. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, just to think about it, uh, seven and nine, and most people are like in first grade, third grade, so it's still like blind learning and those knowledge. To think about that lemon experience, like a lot of people do, but like to think of it as an entrepreneurial spirit mm. and investor where you can find like ways to like make it unique and stuff, which is exactly what entrepreneurship is. And like just like the trash, it's like one of the extraordinary parts, kind of oh. seeing the insight and like and like taking it to orphanages, like you're helping people like unleash their potential, kind of that like it's like made me. I don't know. I don't remember what the card said. It was one of the cards, but do you remember? Making that? others, yeah, making you know. Other people happy or whatever. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, you unleash their potential and you're like helping the world kind of. Love it. Yeah. Love it. So, so beautiful. And I think one thing that you said is, you know, we see a lot of kids. In fact, you know, my neighbor's kid also said recently, put up a lemon stand here. But most of us, you know, when you see the lemon stand, it's to make some quick money and then go use it to buy cookies or whatever, whatever, right? But the way they translated that, they went a little, that's, that's not ordinary. I mean, I think that's a little bit of an extraordinary, but to be able to then go prosecute it like an entrepreneur. That's like the insight part of the and Exactly. So that's uh, beautiful. Sri Uh I think, so one thing that stood out to me was like, so for your business idea, you took, you took like a huge problem, which was a lack of education. And you, you even... So then you, you start pursuing that and then you even took the problem behind that was lack of resourcefulness. And you kind of combine those two problems together by, you know, like, like you said, like being more resourceful with the trash around you. So not only are you helping provide education for thousands of kids around the world, but you're also helping them learn to be more resourceful, which helps them later in life as well, which really stood out to me. Love it. Love it. Yeah, so what I really liked about this is so... As you said, there are many underprivileged people in the world, and they have to use the resources that they have, and which are uh, some are uh, very limited. And uh, given that there are people who are privileged in the world, and then with their idea of trash bus, uh, using whatever ideas or whatever things that are just lying around, I feel like it also teaches them how to, you know, use what they have very carefully and wisely. So I think it's a good idea. Love it. Um, so basically, um, your story from starting from a lemonade stand going all the way into your company for trash pot, I thought like it was really inspiring. And like, I'm also going to be going to college next year, and I want to major in mechanical engineering. And um, see, uh, learn thing about your story, like it inspires me that I want to do like I want to do some projects that can help me to be success successful as well. Love it. Some scripting. I think that something that he said that really stuck with me is the fact that he said start entrepreneurship when you're young, like at our age, because we have the resources and time and energy that, and we have less risk to pursue our passion now than if we were an adult. That's actually a very profound insight. In fact, that if I were to, I mean, there's so many insights for me that that's something that kind of stood out for me, which is when is the, what, when is the right time to be an entrepreneur? When you're in school when your parents actually fund you with free food, free lodging and everything. This is the opportunity where is, there is no risk. In fact, I used to have uh, uh, one of my friends, a daughter, she's now pursuing um, a PhD in mathematics from MIT. And she went to Berkeley with a double major. And you know, when I asked her, it's just like, you know, what do you want to do? And she's like, Srini. I mean, you know, uh, I think back then she used to call me uncle, I believe. But anyway, now it's everybody should only call me Srini. But she says like Srini. It's almost like, you know, it, it, I would be such a failure if I didn't do any startup. It's almost like, you know, the, 
you know, we are provided with so much, you know, I don't have to worry about food and the lodging. And this is the best opportunity for me to go, go solve for something big. You know, many of us, you know, that came from India, you know, we did not have that luxury, right? We were trying to build for our livelihood. We are trying to do this, but all of you don't have that same thing. Now, this is the risk-free, you know, zone to become an entrepreneur, do something bigger than yourself. And if you want to fail, fail it now and have all the lessons. And, and then, you know, you always you know, have to do this. And then the other thing is Siddharth, even though, you know, um, you know, the trash bots, you know, they're making close to $250,000 in revenue, you know, they're just getting started on, on, the, on the big pivotal moment. But he's still pursuing his degree. He's doing, you know, a degree and, and the education. So you don't have to be mutually exclusive. Entrepreneurship or education doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, right? So you can actually pursue these together. Yeah, one thing that I really appreciate about this whole thing in general is that trash bots as a concept is helping children. Oh. Like, of course, you could have done some random thing, talk about the technology industry, but it's really nice that you focused on like the youth and like their creativity, their resourcefulness, because that'll like stick with them for their whole life and they'll be inspired to do something for the next generation. So I think that's like, as you said, like responsibility to you. That's so fantastic. I mean, what I, you know, Siddharth, you know, your, your amazing, amazing insight. And this is one of the best sessions that I attended. You know, just so here's a little secret. And then I'm going to ask Siddharth some questions. And then I'll share Siddharth's uh, contact information with all of you. So if you want to pursue, um, you know, more insights from Siddharth, you know, feel free to do so. Number one is um, Siddharth is the son of, uh, uh, the younger son of one of the, the very successful and and uh, it was almost like a brand VC in Austin, um, uh, and, and is a very good friend of mine. His name is Krishna Srinivasan, and in fact, you know, Krishna just had uh, a, a blockbuster IPO for one of the companies that they invested. It's called Disco. Um, you know, they just uh, went and uh, Krishna went and rang the bell at uh, New York Stock Exchange. But the thing is, what inspired me the most is is almost like Siddharth and Rohit they did not take any help from Krishna. And in fact, it was almost like, you know, Krishna, you know, wanted to be out of the thing. And in fact, they even raised some money from one of the top tier investors in Austin. And Krishna did not even know that. That, you know, Siddharth independently went and Krishna, Siddharth and Rohit went and collected, you know, some money from um, Joe Aragona and, and his thing. And Krishna was like, you know, I did not even know because he did not want his name to be used in, in building or he didn't want to be responsible for that. So that anything, how much did your dad's connection or the network help you or, or you know, everything was all, was all is, is uh, you're making? Well, early on, I'd say, I mean, back when we were just starting, I think it was important from a, you know, mentorship perspective, uh, you, you know, meeting some people here and there would be helpful to get some insights. But at some point, like, you know, you, like you said, you have to create your own brand. It's not like you're not going to be known as this person's son. You know, and, and so from like, um, you know, going and getting customers, going and raising money and all that stuff, it's something that needs to happen by yourself, right? Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we went and got connected to all of our investors ourselves and went and networked. We actually went through an accelerator early 2020 um, that started our pre-seed round off with $100,000, um, Sputnik ATX. And they ended up connecting us to a lot of potential investors and people who ended up converting as our investors. Uh, and so that was really exciting. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest insight, you know, to add my own unique insight, other than what Sanskriti already shared, the biggest thing that, you know, uh, Krishna and Raka did was, uh, Krishna is the chairman of Miracle Foundation, you know, I used to, you know, do some work with them, but every summer, they used to take the kids and have them spend in, in some of these orphanages, where Siddharth and Rohit used to actually go teach and be one among them you know, either teach, you know, math or this. That is one of the key muscles that we want to build at YEC in the triad of technology, entrepreneurship, having a better focus and mind control skills. But the third one is we're all part of one big sharing economy. We're all one family. The more you connect with the people, particularly the people that are underprivileged, the more insights, the more opportunities that we can actually think about. You know, when we surround ourselves with the people that have everything, your ability to think about the possibilities become less. You should actually put yourself in the situations where there are opportunities to be presented with. I think that was one of the biggest, biggest thing that uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, Siddharths and Rohit's parents have done to be able to feel them like a sense of oneness with the people far removed, the other, other side of the ocean. And then they were part of it. And brilliantly how Siddharth say, uh, said today, like he got a message, text messages, where one of his fellow um, you know, citizens is now pursuing bachelors of engineering. You know, look at the potential that you know, we've created, which is like somebody who is part of an orphanage without any home or no opportunity, now is pursuing you know, this. And, and this is the opportunity that we all represent. So one thing that I would want you to take away from this journey is not only expand your horizon, the first and foremost is start becoming an entrepreneur right now. Use the free money, free food and everything. You know, let's actually make our parents broke, right? And then, um, and then the second thing is be connect. Think beyond outside the box. Connect with more people around the world to know what are, there are so many problems. Actually, there's no problem. There's so many opportunities to create excellence in the world. And then brave, get into the details, like what an Adam did at the age of 12, like what uh, Siddhartha and Rohit did you know, at the age of nine and 11. And the, the third thing is, there is a connect the dots. I know uh, Siddhartha and Rohit used to go to DI and robotics camps. So there was a skill that he, he was learning, but most of us only knew it for like the skills but he was able to connect the dots, that robotic experience with the orphanage, the, the underprivileged who do not have enough resources to get the education. And then he connected the dots to figure out like, okay, can I apply my, my skills that I'm learning to create a better experience for those underprivileged? And in fact, that is one of the cards of Nexo. Learning knowledge is ordinary, but using that knowledge multiple times in multiple ways to create a better experience is an extraordinary skill. Right? So now our journey is we all could become Siddharths. In fact, uh, the last question that I would do, um, leave with is, and then uh, we'll do it. So Siddharth, who are your competitors? Yeah, I'd say, you know, people who are offering STEM education today, uh, but nobody's truly offering STEM education with a focus on accessibility. I mean, mm -hmm. the best way to figure out who your competitors are is, you know, who are your potential customers buying instead right mm -hmm. and that would be seen as maybe lego mindstorms used to but lego mindstorms is completely you know off the map these days um mm -hmm. sphero you guys might recognize from the bb-8 robot in star wars mm -hmm. um they um are pretty big in the education space um mm -hmm. you know we have there's this edison bots there's little bits who actually just was purchased by sphero and so mm -hmm. um you know products like that but none of them really have the same focus on accessibility and making STEM education you know, usable by anybody, regardless of skill level, regardless of location and resources and teachers, training level, and all those different things, right? And yeah. so <clears throat> when we go and talk to a school and tell them, you know, about our product and about how we are um, the best of breed um, in terms of, you know, minimal teacher training necessary, maximum scalability from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, maximum accessibility. It's, you know, our doubt what a close rate is extremely high. And the number of school districts are closing, I mean, especially before July, because July, a lot of administrators go on vacation. Um, before July, we were closing a new school district pretty much every single week. Um, mm -hmm. And we're slowly getting back into that rhythm um, now in August. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our, our story and our product is very compelling. And I'm just really excited to keep, you know, implanting it into school districts everywhere. I see. That's a, that's a fantastic thing. I think, you know, some of these kids, you know, who are here, youth entrepreneurs in the school, they have been exposed to things like an Arduino or Blackberry to create yeah. some kind of IIT kind of solutions. But it's meant for people who are already in the coding. You know, the experience that you created, which is like, you know, people at, from the kindergarten all the way through and, and make it fun make it imaginative and the gamification. In fact, you know, your entire design experience with the choice of colors, it actually makes an emotional connection. It makes an yeah. emotional connection. One tagline we just adopted um, and we've been using everywhere now is play productively. Because um, oh. you have a productive goal that you're working towards, but throughout the whole while you're playing, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a playful idea that you're using trash bots, but there's a very productive goal, which is to learn about coding, learn about robotics, learn about STEM, learn about all these things. Yeah, I think there is a famous quote from Elon Musk. How many of you know Sal Khan, Ted uh, Khan Academy? So next week, we're going to watch one of the videos from Sal Khan. Um, 
you know, when uh, Sal Khan and uh, those two are my role models, Sal Khan and Elon Musk. And when Sal Khan was interviewing Elon Musk, you know, one of the things that he said is, uh, you know, what's the future of education? And Elon said, like, you know, I wish education would be more fun. You know, just like he would say, like, you know, I didn't have to tell my kids to go uh, play video games. In fact, he would only have to say, it's like, you know, don't play video games. You would have to pull them away. What if education became more fun like video games? Then you don't have to actually, you know, uh, go force people, like, you know, go do some math, go do some science. You would have to actually pull them away from it. So the opportunities on our end, the school systems, to really reimagine the entire system of education, to make it more fun, more engaging, make it more practical, make it like, you know, take all the trash and the resources and then create more, more possibilities. So the opportunity is here. Siddharth only tackled a small portion of it. So don't you see Siddharth, you know, there are so many competitors, you know, that could potentially be there for you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yep. And um, so let's actually, um, and, and, and before I do it, what is the current uh, cost of the solution? And what's the, the bottom? Yeah, the current cost of solution is a hundred bucks, which I know is still a little bit pricey uh, for for some, you know, especially orphanages and, and for nonprofits and stuff like that. But you know, we we are starting off by selling mainly into the U.S. schools, who um, you know, hundred dollars is a significantly lower price point than like a three hundred fifty dollar Lego Mindstorms product or something like that. And and with that hundred dollar price point, we've been throwing in the app for free. We've been throwing in like a year of you know curriculum access for free professional development and stuff like that. And so we've been doing a lot more service and stuff like that around this one price point. Um, and, 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 and been trying to figure out some different nonprofit um, deployments we can do. We were trying to do something in St. Lucia this year um, in the Caribbean um, and also down in South America a bit, um, as well as in India too, always. And so- Have you explored that uh, go-to-market where you partner with some of the nonprofit and then have them fund it you know, to make it more reachable? 100%. Yeah, we have a lot of corporate um, discussions that are going on right now. I mean, corporate world is a little bit harder to work with because they have a lot of branding, you know, um, mm. finite things around that. But we are in active discussions with at least a half a dozen different, you know, corporations and um, nonprofits to do some pretty interesting deployments here in the US as well as abroad. I see. What is your cost? What's your bomb? So the cost, it continues to go down as well as we manufacture in higher volumes. Um, but it, it, it's our margins. And so on for a hundred dollars, we're making about, you know, a little bit more than 50 bucks, um, which is really good for us because it allows, gives us the flexibility to when we work with nonprofits and schools that, you know, need a little bit, um, you know, lower price point, we can offer discounts and offer, um, you know, it's a little bit of a sweeter deal. Um, but generally that's what it takes in order to scale our company and make sure we can, you know, pay for all the facilities to help our company, you know, scale and grow. I see. Now, peer five years. Are you license what you're doing in terms right. of uh, are you able to sell licensing rights in any way whatsoever? We've thought about that a little bit. Um, and we like to really keep our stuff proprietary and sell it ourselves. Uh, we have considered resellers and distributors um, and even tried out a reseller for a bit. Um, we found that obviously, as you can imagine, we sell our product the best because, you know, we are the product. Um, and so we can go give it to a distributor. We can go give it to a reseller and say, hey, take our product, go sell it. But, you know, in the end, they're almost a, like, you know, you know, it reminds me of like a watch salesman in, in, in Times Square, you know, you go up to them and they open up their trench coat and they're like, which watch do you want? Right. And you can be like, oh, like, you know, that one looks good. And you can be like, oh no, that one looks better. And they're like, okay, yeah, you don't want that one. Okay. Yeah. And they're just basically like, they're a storefront. They're showing you what you might want, but in the end, they're trying to make money in any way possible. They don't really care about your specific product. And so we find works best for sales if we're carrying our own product and selling our own product and doing our own demos. Love it. And then last question, peer about five years into the future and, and uh, tell me, where do you see trash box? Yeah, I mean, I really hope at some point that we are the domain leader for STEM education um, you know, on a, on a global basis. Um, we are really hoping to run a lot of programs with students all across the world. Um, and here in the US, I hope to be really recognized as one of the main leaders in terms of uh, STEM education and one of the main choices for school districts across the nation uh, and across the world. 
Love it. Love it. So, Siddharth, thank you so much for your time. And again, I'll share Siddharth's contact with all of you to explore partnership opportunities or other, other information that you would want. And uh, so let's end today's session with this note and I'll um, sing the final entrepreneurship invocation and then we'll wrap it up. Yep. At some point, we should have a follow-up session with Siddharth. Not now, maybe in a year from now to, you know, we have to see yep, yep. where we've gotten, if we have questions. And... Love it. Okay, everybody, take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Exhale. Take one more deep breath. Exhale. Om Asatoma Sagamayam Tamasoma Jyotir Gamayam Pratyorma Mrutangamayam Om Shanti 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 Let's all take on the journey going from status quo to an excellence, from darkness to the light, from underprivileged to opportunity and empowerment, and let there be peace everywhere. With this wonderful invocation for entrepreneurship, let's all meet again for next week. Thank you all. Great job, Srini. Thank you.